So, as I was saying, right, like uh, ICO, as you guys all know, it's uh, like one of the most buzzing world where people are making millions and millions and probably in 15, 20 minutes. Okay. So, we thought that, okay, let's, you know, we should set up this session where we talk about ICO mostly on a technology part, but also on the regulation part. And that's why I got Eden here. He has a good control on regulation side that, okay, how to do it, where to do it, if someone wants to do it, how to make sure that you, you know, the person who is raising the ICO is safe. So he'll be able to help us on that part. And I mentioned again, we'll be able to talk on the technology part. So uh, let me start by describing this our platform, okay, that what we thought, because we put a whole lot of thought process in order to build this platform, this ICO platform, the IT that's ICO platform. One thing we did is we followed some standards. So tokens generally follow this ERC-20 and ERC-223 standard. And the reason why uh, someone should follow it so that, you know, it is compatible with any third-party wallet. So that's one thing which we followed here. And also, guys, you know, before I even start, if you guys have any question, then I can we can start with the question because I feel like there's nothing much I can tell you. I feel because if you go on internet, you can read, you can you know everything about it. So why not, you know, this time let's start this, this way that if you guys have any question, then start with your question and we can take it from there. Hi, Niraj. Hey, Dan. Can you hear us now? Oh, you're back. I'm back here, Dan. Here finally. Sorry, guys. No problem. Sorry. Thank you and. Have so um, thanks, Eden. Happy to have you here. So yeah, if you can start with, like, you know, with a quick introduction, so that you know everyone knows you. Sure, sure. So um, my name is Eden Dollywall. I'm um, right now working as the chief innovation officer for Slant Lab. Slant Lab is a lab that's uh, been newly created by the Canadian Copyright Licensing Agency uh, to apply. Uh, mainly blockchain applications for create for the creative industries. So basically, looking to create proof of concepts and token models, new business models, new solutions around uh, issues of uh, copyright and rights management and content delivery for industries like um, uh, publishing, media. Uh, music, uh, photography, things like that. And um, prior to that, um, I've spent about 10 years actually just um, helping launch new digital uh, ventures. So I was just um, uh, spent the last five years in Berlin where um, I had a, a venture development company that was helping corporates and startups launch new digital ventures. We focus mainly on uh, business model innovation, human-centered design, and then, you know, playing around with emerging tech like IoT, mobile, um, you know, other technologies as well. So essentially in the last four years, mainly when I was in Berlin, I encountered this amazing technology blockchain and um, I knew that my next career move uh, needed to be in this space because I just, I just thought this was actually quite a revolutionary technology. It was going to be able to change uh, how business and society works, so I wanted to get into this area. And um, I took this role um, at Slant Lab, um, uh, basically, as a sandbox to play around with blockchain and play around with blockchain uh, business models. So as we've been playing with these, um, you know, prototyping new business models, one of the realizations has been that, okay, blockchain doesn't really fit in. A lot of blockchain models um, don't really fit in with your classics or sort of the business model canvas. And, and, and essentially, we started examining, you know, these, uh, these tokenized business models, right, which is a new type of business model um, that's emerged through blockchain technology. And what we've discovered is, is that these tokens, these coins, 
are actually not uh, just securities. They act as securities, but they can act as securities, but they're actually much more than that. So um, that's how we spent, um, how I've gotten into um, uh, ICOs and uh, analysis of token business models, um, really through this exploration through Slant Lab and now actually working with through other uh, blockchain uh, uh, startups. So, uh, maybe, maybe what I'll do, Niraj, is I'll just explain what an ICO is, just to start Yeah, off. sure. Yeah, sure. So, guys, you know, again, feel free to jump on. If you guys have any question, let's make it like two sides. So, if you guys have any question on technology side or uh, on the regulation side, so we are more than happy to take your question. And if not, yeah, Eden, please go ahead with your, you know, with the description of ICO. Sure. So, um... I think it's a little bit short-sighted to look at is a look at a um, um, these coins as as cryptocurrency. Actually, they're crypto assets. That's the first thing that you should re that's you know kind of I would say uh, notable about this this uh, um, you know these these tokens that we should really call them crypto assets. There's really three types of them. Um, there's what's called, you know, as we all know, cryptocurrency, which is, you know, um, um, Bitcoin. There's crypto commodities, which uh, a good example of that is Ether. So Ether is this this, uh, this gas that's that's used for this uh, computing power. And then there's what's called app coins or altcoins. And the app coins and altcoins are actually uh, they're not stores of value, but actually what they are is utility in a new protocol that's being designed. And that's really important to, to, to understand because this is the distinction between a security and, um, you know, uh, what's, uh, you know, what would di differentiate it from a security and uh, from being a crypto asset, right? Uh, that's what that's what can uh, actually uh, make the difference in terms of securities regulation, in terms of uh, uh, how to issue an actual ICO. This difference between whether it's acting as a security or it's whether it's acting as a utility in a system. So that's the first distinction that I think that needs to be made when it comes to this. The other thing that I would mention is, is that an ICO is really crowdfunding, right? So it's crowdfunding um, uh, and blockchain architecture together. And, um, you know, I think one of the important things to understand when it comes to ICOs is that these exist because blockchain platforms, these new protocols that are, that are trying to be developed, require a lot of uh, human capital, they require a lot of network effects, and they require capital that's actually out of the ordinary when it comes to, um, you know, starting a new technology venture, right? Most technology ventures, what we've learned from the dot-com um, boom and bust is that they didn't require all the capital that that uh, VCs were throwing in other industries, right? That's why the there was a dot-com boom and a dot-com bust because they were applying, um, they were overcapitalizing this this space to and then not receiving the returns, right? And so this is how VCs and investment has smartened up over 20 years of internet. But the difference is, is with these blockchain uh, ventures, they're built on such um, uh, robust uh, technology and on business models that are actually quite futuristic that they need what's called a long breath, right? So the long breath is, is, um, is when you're actually overcapitalizing or substantially capitalizing a new venture so that it has a longer sustainability for development, for that road, uh, to actually meet those uh, um, milestones uh, to actually eventually develop that, uh, that, 
that platform and then um, have the network effects uh, that build the, the business model. So what an ICO is doing is it's doing two things. With the utility of the token, it's creating uh, network effects so that you're not just having investment into the platform, you actually have participating in the network effects and the development of uh, you know, this open source um, project. So that's why ICOs are important because it's actually um, it's facilitating the type of innovation in this digital space that requires quite a bit of capital. And then secondly, beyond the funding, it's this participation in network effects that are really um, important in pushing this, the success of these projects. So that's what I would say is most important to know about ICOs. The fact that these are crypto assets, that there's different types of crypto assets, that there's actually there's an importance on the utility of the token, not just the investment component or the funding component. And that utility is really important because that's part of creating the network effect and helping uh, the overall development of, these, of, this, of, of the protocol that's being proposed. Eden, I have a one question here. So, sure. do you think ICO is mainly for blockchain business only? If suppose I have some other business which has nothing to do with blockchain, suppose I want to open a flower shop or something like that, do you think ICO is the way to go, or I should be away from the ICO business? I think um, I think yeah. You, there's no way that I can see to get around the decentralized component of, uh, of, of an ICO. If you're proposing a, uh, an ICO project or to raise funds through an ICO, I think what you're trying to do, what's really fundamental to understand is you're actually, um, you're democratizing the development and, and you want the participation of the network uh -huh. that's investing in. So if you're right. creating you know, a flower shop, that's fine. You can actually create a flower shop, but it would have to be a decentralized flower shop, and you would be actually basically proposing that the network is help, uh, helping uh, develop the economy for that flower shop. I think another, you know, I mean, it brings up a good point, actually, uh -huh. or a good distinction in that blockchains, this particular model is not creating a business model. It's actually creating an economy, and that's what's really right. important. You're actually creating a little bubble economy that's, uh, to a certain, a certain extent, self-sustaining, but also, uh, you know, creating a supply demand that's pushing the development of the project further. So, I would say, you know, the it's it's pretty hard to get past having a decentralized component if you're going to issue an ICO. Otherwise, it'll just be merely a security. Okay. Yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. Thanks. So, Eden, one of our participants, Dhiren, has a question for you. He says, uh, would you be able to provide any tips on how to identify a good ICO? There are many now, and it is quite confusing to invest. Yeah, that's true. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Eden, being on, <laughs> being totally unbiased, maybe you know you want to take this question. Oh yeah, hundred percent. So I mean, this is part of the reason actually that um, uh, me and Niraj are are collaborating. You know, you have an ICO platform. It's going to issue uh, all sorts of um, uh, ICOs for for the for the market to invest in, but then. Um, part of the value of such a platform would be to, you know, provide some sort of resource in terms of vetting uh, these ICOs. So what I would say is, you know, there's kind of, uh, there's, there's some important components. One is you, you want to make sure that the, uh, 
that the legal aspect is well understood that they're they're actually issuing from you know a Switzerland or a Singapore um, you know or a Gibraltar that's important to have that just to just so that there's some legal um, some regulations that they can work through that are actually legally feasible um, so you want to do that you also want to ideally you want to actually see the product built to a certain extent um, you know if, if it's completely um, you know if, if you don't have a any any code that's out there regarding this uh -huh. particular project then you know it's basically a ghost so there should be some code that's in github and there should be some discussions in these uh, in these forums and there should be some uh, you should see see a community building around the project right another big right. thing i would say is that if you see a project that's pre-mined that's probably uh -huh. one you want to stay away from because pre-mining is basically you know giving away a token it's incentivizing the development of uh, this particular project through you know through the token right and it really should be uh, incentivized through the through the economy and the function of the token it shouldn't be some sort of pay, like shouldn't be payment oriented so pre-mining is something that I would look for. If it's being pre-mined, I definitely wouldn't invest in. Um, and then beyond that, you know, I would say you want to make sure there's a level of um, uh, transparency uh -huh. in, of the actual founders, understanding who the team members are, understanding you know what their backgrounds are. Have they launched a venture before? Do they have uh, um, experience in blockchain you know do they have yeah. good advisors behind them and then you know along with that you want to also take a look, look at the vetting schedule so the vesting schedule of their tokens right if the uh -huh. if the founders can sell their tokens the day after the ICO is issued that's not a good sign that means that they're not committed to that ICO right they're not committed right, right. To so you want to see um, a good vesting period, you know, at least one year, if not two years, before the founders can actually sell any of their tokens. You also want to see an escrow, so that escrow will give a roadmap to how the the finances are going to be distributed, and you want to see it distributed over a period of time. You don't want to see lump sum distribution um, uh -huh. because you know, as I said, the long breath of these projects, I mean, they're building big platforms. They need the time to build it. It should be um, sort of well uh, articulated in a roadmap and to be right. have a plan in which all the finances are dispensed uh, in one sitting is probably not a good plan. I think you want to look at that. And then, you know, the difficulty is is actually the crypto economics, right? How to value a um, a token, the the present value and the future value, and that's actually that's something that I'm personally working on. That's something that uh, is uh, importance to DLT Labs as well yeah. with this ICO platform. And I actually would uh, at this point say if anybody is a mathematician or an economist and is interested in uh, helping us build some models uh, in uh, evaluating um, or you know building a valuation of a token um, definitely contact me and um, we can collaborate uh, that's something that uh, I'm definitely uh, I'm looking for those type of people so um, you know we can I can give I can leave my email uh, or you can contact Niraj if uh, you're interested in helping us out in terms of uh, uh, building some uh, some uh, mathematical models around valuation. Yeah, that sounds great, Eden. I will share your details also with everyone. So if anyone wants to, you know, contact, they can contact you also directly. Thanks. Okay. That's good answer. 
So, Dheeran, I think uh, that's the answer to your question. If you have any counter question, then take the mic and continue to ask. And if not, then I would like to thank Dheeran. I would like to pass to Chatan. Chatan, do you want to take the mic and uh, ask your question? Sure. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Here's a question. Uh, let's say you want to start a P2P I, uh, platform ICO uh, in Canada. You yeah. will be collecting money for doing some kind of insurance. Uh, so, question is, how many regulators will be involved in this kind of scheme? Will it be just the insurance regulator? Will it be banking regulator? Or will it be the securities and exchange commission kind of regulator? The question which I'm trying to, I mean, the point which I'm trying to raise is that on the blockchain, uh, the distinction between these regulators is very blurred. Yeah. In the physical world, uh, the separations are uh, quite well known. But on the blockchain right. world, uh, the separations are so blurred. So how do you determine, at least in Canada, uh, which regulators you need to satisfy and uh, is there any process in place to do that? Right. So good question. So, um, well, it just so happens I was asked to be on the advisory board for Blockchain Canada. And uh, Blockchain Canada will be working with the Ontario Securities Commission, um, which is the which is the organization that that regulates these tokens and these ICOs. You can pretty much uh, focus all your attention towards the Securities Commissions in whatever country you're interested in issuing a token. So right now in Canada, you actually can't issue a token. You can't do it. If um, if you want to issue a token, you'll have to set up in Switzerland and Singapore. And then what you'll have to do, if you want to be as compliant as possible, you'll want to do AML and KYC in the countries or to the residents of the countries that you issue to. So, for example, you would want to set up in Singapore, do your crowd sale but then do they do the uh, AML and KYC in accordance to the Ontario Securities Commission um, in Canada um, so that you can issue to Canadians so um, one thing that one thing I will say is that uh, each province in Canada has its own Securities Commission but the Ontario Securities Commission is pretty much the lead dog because, uh, as you know, the Toronto is a big financial hub and uh, they tend to, the other provinces tend to quickly follow Ontario Securities Commission. So if the Ontario Securities Commission um, um, approves and builds guidelines for tokens to be issued, um, then, um, then I think um, you you pretty much be safe in Canada in general. But uh, you will want to look at a provincial level. But the main body you'd want to look at is uh, the Ontario Securities Commission. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it helps a lot. I think we are entering the realm of regulatory arbitrage. That is a you're trying to play one regulator in one country with another regulator in another country. That's, that's what I uh, currently even I'm trying to figure out. Uh, where best to raise the token, where best to deploy it, and how to go about it. But well, uh, thanks a lot. That helps a lot. I'll tell you this, okay. If you look at these tokens, where they're actually, where the funding is actually coming from, it's mostly coming from Chinese market. So... Uh, you know, the Chinese are trying to get their money out of China in, in many different ways, and this is actually kind of a very uh, cost-effective and uh, uh, private way of uh, getting their money out of the Chinese market. So a lot of the um, cryptocurrency market is, is, happens to be dictated by, uh, by China. And then the other thing I would say is the European regulation is actually much more lenient and open than the North American markets right now. So that's why you do see more, um, if you looked at the, the volumes of where the investment is coming from, 
you'll you'll find that there's disproportionately China and then after that uh, a European base. Right. Thanks, Eden. So, guys, any any other questions for Eden? Yeah. Uh, hi, Eden. Uh, this is Mayank. Hi. So, I have one question. So, I had one question like you said uh, about the returns thing that you know when the dot com bubble was there, uh, you know, but like you know when I see the ICO thing, it kicks me more like a Kickstarter where like you know where you are investing in a product and you'll get the tokens for that product. You can't do much with those tokens. So, like, how do you, I mean, how do you, will, how will you define returns on those kind of things? Yeah, so I mean, there is the naturally there is the uh, there is the um, it does seem like a Kickstarter project, and I don't I don't think that's wrong to actually kind of view it that way. The difference is is what the what the offerings are are much more sophisticated than uh, than than the stuff that's on Kickstarter, right? On Kickstarter, I mean, I know there's a lot of different projects, but if you think of for something like, for example, Store J, they're offering tokens uh, for storage, and then you think of the massive storage um, market that's out there, and the and just how much of the storage is unused. That you know, a lot of companies buy storage and they're not even using it. So it cre it can create actually its own marketplace of exchanging the tokens for you know for storage that isn't even used, and I think this is the real distinction that there is a marketplace and economy to be formed of services, um, you know, in which you can earn, exchange, uh, and uh, and and spend these tokens. So. There's a supply and demand that can actually be quite liquid with, through these assets, whereas in Kickstarter, it's true, yeah, you invest in it and you get something, but it's actually the liquidity and the exchange that makes it, um, well, you know, it just, it's, not, it's not like an ICO in that, in that sense. Okay. Okay, and one more thing, like you know, ICO is so as you said, it uh, it you know makes uh, I mean it gives you a crypto asset kind of thing. So when you go like you have you know so many kind of you know new new projects coming in, new crypto assets coming in. So uh, like how you know because when you see that it becomes difficult to you know transact. You know you have to maintain a separate address. You have to maintain a separate account. So like these complications come so like you know is there any way to resolve them all those kind of things because it's a huge you know ecosystem you can say yeah yeah well I mean I think this is part of the challenges of this this technology right there's a lot of infrastructure and there's a lot of user experiences and and you know new business slash economic models that still have to be figured out. So, you know, those pain points, people are trying to figure it out, they're trying to make it easier and people are spending, you know, spending a lot of time and money and effort and investment over that. And I think, you know, I mean, these are the type of things when, when people say, when will blockchain be mainstream, it's when these things get solved. So the bad news is, is that these things, you know, the adoption will take time because it's dependent on these type of things. but the good news is is that if you can solve some of these challenges, you probably are on to a, you know, quite a successful um, um, project slash business. Mm, yeah, I agree. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the answer. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no. So next question is from Ayush. He's asking about the security. Maybe I can take those questions. So he's saying, how about the security attacks and how much? Is it secured? As we can see, nothing in terms of data is secured. So I used to answer your question. See, in blockchain world, we all have heard that there have been certain number of attacks. Okay, but neither of the time blockchain has been hacked. No one ever has hacked blockchain system. 
what was hacked or what has been hacked is the exchanges or crypto you know the front part not the blockchain so there is an integration between the front our world or you know the middle tier and the blockchain so the problem is the developers who are doing this ICOs or who are creating this platform or who are creating this exchange you know they are not bank developers or they do not undergo training they do not know how to do finance development okay so when they write a middleware they do not integrate it properly with the blockchain or the middleware itself is not secure and that's what we see during the DAO okay DAO was not a problem with Ethereum it was a problem how the contract was written okay so if it would have been written in a better way then DAO probably would have never been happened the another analogy I say is like it's just like blockchain is like an internet and banks for example banks is an application so the way we have a finance on top of blockchain we have banks on top of internet so it's the banks who get hacked never the internet get hacked so whenever a bank get get hacked we don't say the internet got hacked same way whenever an exchange of front end of blockchain gets hacked that doesn't mean blockchain is getting hacked and blockchain has never been got hacked so if the data is on blockchain it is 100% secure no one can take it well in future maybe you know it might get hacked but as of today it's close to impossible to hack any data on blockchain and it has never happened okay so once the data is on blockchain it is secure so Eden I do not know you want to add something but uh, that's my point right that if yes. the data is on blockchain it's 100 percent secure yeah it's you know it's essentially imagine you have a house and mm -hmm. you have a the blockchain as the security system so nobody can nobody's entering that house nobody nobody has ever been able to um, get past the security system but right. you know, if you go and you leave your the keys to your house at the coffee shop and somebody takes those keys they could just walk into your house exactly and that's, that's usually what where where things go wrong is people don't protect their keys so when you don't protect your cryptographic keys, then you can just walk into these systems or, you know, you can walk into and take whatever you want. So the house is secure, blockchain is secure, but the keys need to be secured and that's where people go wrong. Mm -hmm. That's true. Totally agree. Yeah. Thanks, Eden. So Ayush, I hope that answers your question. If not, then, you know, take the mic and ask any counter question. Sure, Neeraj. I, I definitely wanted to add my question more. Uh, as you mentioned about the uh, example of banking application, right? So if you talk about banking application, you, you mentioned that it has been uh, is using internet. So again, there, there are a few vulnerabilities uh, as per uh, using the internet, right? For example, if I'm using an application and it has some uh, SSL or a TLS kind of a vulnerability due to which the application is vulnerable. Right, so which makes uh, any of the uh, individual guy uh, to just uh, have an access to that application, right? Similarly, that's what yeah. my question was: is uh, if you talk about, as you have mentioned about the uh, cryptographic uh, uh, keys as well, right? So as it is uh -huh. using SHA two fifty six, could it that if if any if uh, due to any uh, any person's mistake or or uh, due to any any circumstances, if, if any of the keys uh, as these are hashed. But still, if, if they are hacked or, or due to some uncertain reasons, if uh, these keys are available for uh, any any victim or uh, any of the attacker, so uh, like uh -huh. what, definitely there might be something or the options which may, which definitely can make it vulnerable. That's right. So that's like right. To answer so that's this. Uh, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I see. If SHA-256 is hacked, basically everything in the world is hacked. Right. If you are talking about the failure of SHA-256, then nothing in the world will be secure. So that will be until unless quantum computing takes over and the computing speed has got to the such a speed that SHA-256 can be had. Second thing, there are a lot of blockchains which are working on applications like creating a blockchain in which uh, this quantum computing thing or hacking of SHA-256 will be like uh, won't matter. So things are under process and maybe in near future or maybe the, till the time the quantum computing kicks in, we will be ahead of that thing. Yeah, and just to add on it, so um, you mentioned, right, that, okay, uh, for example, 
uh, this connection between the two networks or uh, you know the protocols and everything see what I was trying to say is internet what is internet internet is just an infrastructure on top of which application runs okay and that can be any application it can be application that connects to so even the www internet protocol or anything is an application which runs all over the internet platform or the internet infrastructure what blockchain is blockchain is nothing but it is just an infrastructure okay at any point of time internet has never been hacked I mean to say the platform itself can't be hacked on the same way blockchain is an infrastructure you can't hack the platform itself that is you know the blocks of the data so here on internet the only messages can be passed okay that's that's what internet is what blockchain is blockchain is a platform where data as well as messages can be passed so the benefit of blockchain is when I say the platform is secure so the data which is on the platform is also secure because blockchain is such a platform which can store messages as well as it can store the data unlike internet where the data still is secured at, at a centralized place and it is not part of internet right so internet as an infrastructure cannot store data always if you have to store data you create another server which is a centralized server where you store data and it is like totally like it's hackable but on blockchain the data itself is over the internet and and the infrastructure cannot be hacked that's why we say you know the data since it is on top of a blockchain it cannot be hacked it's a little complicated to visualize what I'm trying to say but think about it and then you will see you know what I'm trying to say it's data and internet at the same level unlike internet uh, hi Neeraj, hi this is Raj talking. Yeah. Uh, so I had a question, so how are you securing these uh, private keys? Is there a, you know, what kind of protection are you taking to secure the private keys? Let's say, so, I don't know, if you have a wallet or how, however mm -hmm. it is, how are you securing okay. those? I mean, I understand the internet analogy, analogy, but yeah, uh, yeah. I just would like to understand how you protect that private key. A lot of the wallets are getting hacked, you know, the private mm -hmm. keys are getting hacked for people, right? Okay, see, private key is getting hacked as I said because exchanges are getting hacked so the problem is when you go on any exchange okay if it is a good exchange that exchange will not store your private key if it is the same way take it this way right when you create a login at the bank okay you create an online banking take does bank store your password no it asks you to store the password and password is completely equivalent to your private key so there are certain exchanges just because they are you know <laughs> their platform is not good enough or you know they have not de developed their platform pro properly what they do they store your private key Be okay because they have not developed a system to give you the private key so that you know you own it ideally none of the platforms should store your private key it should be you like you yourself should be responsible to store your private key and as long as you keep your privacy secure, no one in the world can hack your account. So again, I'm repeating myself to summarize what I'm saying. None of the platform should store private key on your behalf. It is your responsibility to keep your private key secure and there are various ways by which you can keep your private key secure. If any, if you see any exchange, Something is storing your private key. That's strong, and that's why it is getting hacked because it is got uh, disconnected. So I was saying it's very easy for you know hackers to get into the database of exchange and store the price and you know pick up the private keys from there. But if you have somewhere somewhere with you, then it's close to impossible to hack it. So um, does that make sense? I just wanted to mention that you know. Yeah, go, go ahead. I'm I'm uh, I'm actually working. Uh, one of the companies I'm advising is uh, trying to solve this problem of managing your keys, right? Managing your cryptographic keys. So, actually, yeah. what what they're proposing is that instead of trying to manage these keys, that you become your key. So, either through exactly. uh, fingerprint or facial recognition. Um, yeah. And and the, and then therefore you know you actually become your crypto back graphic key. Then it's a lot easier to take care of because right now, you know, a lot of people are doing a you know it's still a, a kind of a, a not a headache but 
you know, it takes a lot of effort to manage your keys sometimes. Exactly, protect. totally. That's right. Yeah, and in coming days, that's what we will see, that, you know, private keys will be secured by some, you know, biometric stuff, probably, you know, eye retina or fingerprint or something, right? But again, it's the same thing, right, that, you know, if you, it's your phone, right, if you open your, uh, if you don't lock your phone, it's your problem. But the thing yeah. is, ultimately, it will be the user who will be responsible to secure your password or private key or whatever name you give, right, Eden? Yeah. Because today also, yeah. in banking system, it is you. You as a person who is responsible to secure your password. If you share your password with anyone, you know, bank is not responsible for the security. No, but I think, uh, if I'm not wrong, the uh, private keys are saved in the node, right? It's stored in the nodes as well, right? No, 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 no. By default, it is there, but it's your responsibility to move from there. It's not stored. It is created there, then it's your responsibility to move it from there. So actually, you know, this is a very good thing and that takes me to the next part of our, you know, uh, of our discussion today, the demo. So let, let us show you our demo and our, we will show you, you know, how we are handling the private key. So Omesh, get ready for the demo. So what you will see here is that what we are doing, we are not storing. So we as a platform, that's why I say, you know, it's very, the platform is plays most crucial role that how secure your token or coin or whatever your digital currency or whatever you say is. In our demo you will see that you create a private key, okay. It is the private key is encrypted by password. I as a platform do not know your private key. I do not know your password, okay. And what I do, I email, email the encrypted private key to your email. So now it's a two level of security. One thing your email so there is a file which resides in your email which is totally encrypted by your password and that file contains your private key so now suppose you know you come and buy something on my DRT last platform okay and my DRT last platform gets hacked you know someone you know takes away the middleware frontier everything still they cannot touch your crypto coin or they will cannot touch your ICO or whatever it is okay because you have the private key no one else in the world has your private key what other exchanges make a mistake is because they do not know this technology of sh giving the ownership of private key to the user, they store the private keys. If they get hacked, then everything is gone. Make sense? So I think uh, let's jump to the demo part and that will make things you clear because whatever you said, that is not right. It's not the node which stores the private key. Nodes help in creating the private key, but you know, there, there, there is a, we have designed like as a part of DIT we have a design, we have designed a system where we give the ownership to the user to store your private key securely with you. And we have made quite easy. And that's what we will demo. Fair enough. So since we have limited time, so I'll jump on the demo. So Omesh, you are ready for the demo, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. So yes, start, let's get started. So uh, guys, a quick note about this demo, this platform, another, uh, you know, good part of this platform is we are running it on Ring B test network, and I think that's the right word, word Ajay, right? It's Ring B, right? Ajay? Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And probably this is one of the first platform which is running not on proof of work, but this is proof of, proof of authority, authority, POA. So two special things that yes, this is we have tried to make this platform, you know as secure as possible, as easy to use as possible. And also, this is not running on proof of work. And this is running on proof of authority. So guys, if, like we will start with the demo and if you have question, you know, uh, let us know. So may I shall, you know, all the control to you. Get started with the demo and, you know, try to explain each and every part of it. So especially the security part so that, you know, everyone is okay with the security. Sure, sure. sure. So, uh, I hope my screen is visible to everybody. Yes, yes Omesh. Omesh. Yeah. So, uh, actually, uh, we made this platform as generic as possible. Uh, we can customize it uh, as per like our client need. And uh, so, in this platform, what I am going to uh, show you guys, like the uh, offering is already... Uh, all the smart contracts are already deployed and how a user can come and purchase a, a coin and uh, what all the things he can do with that and this is the flow so like uh, yeah. yeah 
So, so one thing, one thing, Umesh, I can add is so the way we are doing here is we are not saying that you know you can come and create your own coin here. The way we have modeled it in order to make it secure that suppose you own a company X Y Z, okay. So what we do is we take this platform, we customize as Umesh mentioned, it is hundred percent customizable. We customize it based on your need and we host it for you. Okay, so it is under your umbrella, it is under your security, it is under your infrastructure, nothing to do with us. So more or less, it's more like a white label product, but but secure, like we got like DLT lab security here. Okay, and also we have customized it in such a way that tomorrow if you want to do some AML or KYC, we can integrate it with any third party AML or KYC, or we can build an AML and KYC based on, you know, our customers need. That's how this platform has been built. Sorry, Mish. Just yeah. uh, carry on. Yeah. yeah. So if user is coming for like uh, some buying some offering, so he'll come and in, uh, register in the system. So I'll quickly register. So I hope it's visible to everybody, right? So as soon as I uh, sign up in system, I uh, it will trigger one mail to verify email. So once it is verified, user can log in from here. Yeah, as soon as user logs in, it asks two things. One is passphrase and another thing is password to create account. So uh, one by one, I'll explain what all these things are. So passphrase is just some random uh, sentence that you that you can use. So this passphrase will be used to generate your uh, uh, account and private key. So this account is like uh, uh, this algorithm is used such a way that is compatible with the every wallet and it is working with the, all, all the wallet in the like blockchain world. So, so as, I, as I told like this passphrase using this passphrase you will be able to generate your account and private key. And here is password. So you can see like title here for password, enter pass, password to encrypt your private key. As a, as a platform, we are not storing your, we are not storing your private key at all. So the, whatever private key will be generated on the fly, that private key will be encrypted using this password. And that encrypted value will be sent to you. You have to store that encrypted value and you have to remember your password without using both of them all together nobody can access your system your account so i'll just go ahead and create account so as soon as, soon as i am uh, i am into system uh, i am in my wallet section in my wallet section you can see uh, like your wallet address is generated here so this is your wallet address where you can store uh, ether as well as offering like whatever coin offering is there currently we have uh, a dlt tokens that can be uh, purchased so as soon as this wallet is generated uh, this address is generated you'll see you'll you'll see one uh, one more trigger to one more mail is triggered to your system and it is saying this is your authorization key and for for doing any transaction for doing any transaction in the system you have to use this authorization key because i as i specified earlier also as a system we are not storing private key we are generating on the fly using this authorization key and your password Okay, now for uh, for buying some DLT tokens, you need to have some ether. 
So currently uh, we are not having any ether because we just created a wallet. So either we can fetch it from some other account or we can purchase here also as a system we are uh, we we are having that capability as well. So but currently the system is uh, deployed on ring B, uh, ring B test network. So uh, and this is like uh, we need just a test ether to do that. So there are faucet you can uh, using using that faucet you can get some ether. So I'll just try to get some ether from the ring B faucet. Okay, this is a faucet. It needs account in which you. So this ring B faucet, they have uh, uh, enabled GitHub authentication for getting some money in your account. First, you need to create a file having that account in it. And you have to do this thing only for the test network, you know, because we are working on test. If it would have been a production, then, uh, you know, you will have your Ether or as you mentioned, you know, you will transfer Ether to this account from some other account where you have real Ether. So this this step, whatever Umesh is doing, this is just for the test purpose. Since we are in the test environment, so you need to get some test Ether in order to play with it. So that's what we are showing how to get test Ether because we will be sharing this link to you so that you guys can play with this platform. Okay. So currently I have a test ether in another account, I can transfer as well, but uh, specifically I, I am showing this because you may not have some any ether in any account, so you can get it from this faucet. So once you create this file and copy the copy link and provide in ring B faucet and you can get some ether from there. So it will be like for per user in GitHub, you can get uh, some, there is some li limitation for uh, if I'll choose first option, I'll not get any ether till next eight hours. So, so I'll choose this option. I'll, okay. As soon as I submitted funding request accepted for this. And this is like, tran Okay, as soon as this transaction will be mined, it will be available in my wallet. So, uh, generally it takes around, uh, generally it takes around 30 seconds in uh, ring B network to transaction get mined. So, see, uh, I just got my ether in my wallet. Here you can see uh, C3 ether. So now second, now I I have my wallet, I have my account, I have uh, ether in it. Now I can go ahead and buy some tokens, TLT tokens using this. So I'll go to buy section for this. So as you can see right here, token price is written uh, based upon that. In one ether, I'll get around 2,000 tokens. So I'm going ahead and purchasing 2,000 tokens. So as soon as I am trying to purchase 2,000 token, it is telling me provide me encrypted key and secret pin. So, so encrypted key is the key that we have sent in mail. Because you are trying to do some transaction on blockchain and that requires private key. So as, as specified earlier, we are not readily saving your private key in our system. So you have to provide this key and password to generate private key and that private key will be used for transaction. So, So in that meantime, Omesh is doing this transaction. So guys, I will have to drop. Uh, so thanks anyway. So I'll drop, but everyone else will be there. Also, I will add Eden to our Slack group. So if you guys have any other questions, you know, you can ask on our Slack group. If anyone of you is not connected on a Slack group, then, you know, make a request, let us know. 
and we will add you on our Slack group so you guys can ask question to either indirectly as required. All right, thanks. Umesh, continue. Carry on. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Neeraj. So. Just let me copy this properly. Hey, Umesh, this is Ayush. Yeah, Ayush. Uh, I have a query, like you mentioned about the private key, right? Yeah. So, uh, while the transaction, a uh, private key will be generated. So, uh, where will that private key be stored? Private key, that's what I am saying. A private key will never store it. So, whatever private key will be generated will encrypt using your password. And that encrypted key will be sent to uh, uh, mail. Okay. And then, uh, so if, if if yeah, so if uh, we are having a transaction between two people in a pair, uh, how will that get validated uh, about the key? Like there will be some some verification done, right? While while having the transactions, or how is it? No, no, I am not getting your question. Can you come again? saying uh, while while there are two peers uh, I'm just sending my token from one person to another right okay and as I have uh, generated certain tokens so how will that be validated or verified uh, just just uh, need a more uh, better uh, light on that how will that work no no actually it's inher inherited uh, like uh, it is inherent inherently will do like that your account can't be accessed without your private key. So until and unless you are providing right encrypted key or right password, that transaction can't commit to blockchain. So if transaction can't be committed to blockchain, so obviously that token will not be transferred to some other party. Uh, yes, the question uh, he's trying to ask is, Typically in a blockchain environment, there will be validation of the data, right? The, the guy who is sending uh, and the guy who is receiving and if there is any double spend or things like that, right? Yeah. yeah. So do you require uh, the private key in order to for the nodes to do such validation is I think is the question. No, we don't require that. So... Uh, Actually, I think something, some problem with my internet, I'll try to log in with. Okay, so, uh, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, this is some existing account. Now you can see already 1500 token is there and there is some ether and uh, uh, this is address and this is the same wallet we talked about. So what I'll do, uh, I'll uh, try to buy more, uh, more token via this account. Okay, just just one second. So I'll go to buy section and already 1500 token was there I'll try to buy some more so 
I think my full screen is not visible because of that some problem is happening. Let me share my full screen first of all. Okay. So this is encrypted key for this account. I have to enter password. So now, uh, like you, you can see, right? I tried to purchase two thousand more. As I as I said, it will take around thirty second to commit the transaction. So. So now you can see like I have 3500 tokens and my ether balance got detected and transaction history is maintained here. So uh, now I have token available with me. Now what all things I can do? I can transfer somebody. I can. So. So I can transfer somebody. So first of all, I'll show that part. Then I'll talk about the whatever token is created using a smart contract. So I have a I'm create uh, I'm logging in with uh, some other account. whatever just I created. Okay. So this is the account is not having any token. So I'll try to transfer some token to this account. This is adjusting account. Now I'm going to miss and I'll try to transfer some token. So currently 3500 to token is there. So I have to transfer to this account. So 1000 token again for transferring as well. We need a private key. So that will generate on the fly using the encrypted key, whatever we sent and password. So now I'll go to my wallet. So currently still it is showing 3500. Let transaction to be commit. Uh, we are uh, preparing one more section here in which you can see the progress of transaction as well. So now you can see like uh, 1000 transaction is debited and beneficiary is addressing. Now token remaining is 2500 and if we go to Ajay account and I should be able to have 1000 token. So uh, uh, these are the like uh, using this platform we can buy tokens securely transfer securely apart from that we have another features as well. Currently, we have not deployed on this demo part. Uh, it is in uh, development uh, phase. So you can withdraw your ether from here itself. You can export private key if you want to have it and you want to import in some other wallet. In some other wallet, you can see your ether balance as well as DLT token balance also. Reason is this this whatever token is created, this token is fully uh, uh, created based on uh, ERC 20 uh, standards. So it will be uh, you can see your balance in any wallet as well if you have private key. So now uh, we are going to have some feature like you can directly buy currently you can you if you want to purchase token you have to have ether so you can directly buy using USD or Bitcoin. 
so and uh, apart from that uh, uh, you can set up recurring transfer as well uh, uh, this feature one of the feature we are thinking about Re recurring, uh, you can set up recurring transfer for particular date of month and apart from that you can authorize some user some other user to spend on behalf of you so these are the feature in pipeline so now i'll more talk about like uh, when when i uh, uh, i'll talk about the dlt token whatever is created first first of all we'll see what happened to this account okay so it is on ring p so we can go to ring b and in block explorer we can see all the transaction that is committed to blockchain so first of all i'll see this account okay now you can see five minute ago five minute ago i transferred one ether to some contract so i i'll see uh, i'll show you uh, what is this contract so this is the contract that is the uh, working uh, that is working for uh, like allotting uh, allotting the uh, dlt coin based upon whatever ether he, uh, this contract is receiving so based upon ether value it is assigning uh, tokens in that so it means this is the uh, this is the address of the token contract so now we can see and uh, and see the details of the token so if you go to erc20 token search if you place the address of the token contract if i am searching you you can see few things here so uh, total supply till date is this much and name is dlt coin symbol is dlt and uh, decimal decimal means uh, uh, sorry uh, decimal means uh, after decimal uh, what is the lowest possible uh, unit of this coin that you can transact like uh, if, if it is 3 so 0.001 is the lowest that you can transact so now here you can see uh, it is able to search here because it is fully compatible with the standards and even you can see here it is giving the link for uh, erc20 now if i'll go to this token and in token transfer events if you see 1000 1000 token i have transferred to some other account okay may so let's see abe8 i transfer to ajay so abe889 is like i abe889 i transferred 1000 it is it is showing one because 1000 i am uh, considering the lowest unit of the, so it is like 1.000 so it is uh, okay i am making uh, people confused here so just like ether if you take example of ether lowest unit is v so in whatever transaction happens that happens in v only so similarly for dlt token whatever transaction is happening that is happening in lowest unit currently we have not named any uh, so so suppose uh, uh, major unit we can say dlt coin and some uh, like whatever lowest transaction can be done that we can call some other unit so similar similarly uh, once i am doing 1000 of that uh, lowest transaction in lowest unit then it is like one dlt token so you can see right i transferred 1000 uh, of uh, dlt token to this uh, ajay just 4 minute ago so via this blockchain uh, explorer what i am trying to show ki whatever uh, token is created that is fully compatible with erc20 and erc223 that is some enhancement in erc20 and uh, 
it is uh, uh, you can see your uh, balance even in some other uh, any any wallet if you have private key and uh, you can see uh, all the transaction in blockchain explorer so you you will have full visibility of your wallet address and for every transaction you have full visibility because it is following that is standard apart from that this platform is for like uh, if you are not much into technology then then also you can use this platform so if you are using if you are using platform so uh, uh, apart from this existing functionality we can enforce few other fun functionality as well uh, that extendability also we have in like uh, in features one one uh, one feature we can have for example one feature we can have ki only the person in uh, for kyc or aml is done only those person can purchase so that kind of feature means if somebody is coming to platform only those person can be for whoever kyc and aml is done we can integrate a third party kyc aml or as a as a company if you want to do you can uh, do by your uh, manually also so if that is done then only this kind of enforcement uh, also we can put here and if you want to some kind of enforcement like uh, transaction because if you are following strictly kyc aml so you don't want to uh, your token to be with uh, any other person for whom kyc or aml is not done so we can put some enforcement like uh, whoever is in our platform and for the person if kyc aml is done to that person only token can be transferred so using platform is giving us all these benefits we can uh, work with regulators and whatever based upon your location whatever uh, required you can enforce from here so currently as i said all these things we can put but this is totally following like uh, erc 20 so from some other wallet also if you transfer uh, some ether to token contract you will get that token so so this this is a demo from my side if any uh, question then i can answer that Thanks, Amesh. Thanks for the demo. Yeah, hi, Amesh. Ishan, this side. Yeah. Uh, so, just to add to the question in the private keys that a uh, couple of people asked earlier. Yeah. So, I just want to know. So, uh, if you don't mind me asking, so are you essentially decrypting the uh, encrypted authorization key that you sent to the mail? Are you essentially decrypting it and then using the private key to sign the transactions? Based because you'll still need a private key to authorize the transactions, right? yeah uh, in in a way yes we are doing that but uh, apart from that there are three four more steps involved so basically i uh, this is like uh, i ipr for us uh, i can't discuss but okay. this is the idea yeah so it's not one step only it 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 involves like four five steps in that four, uh, that authorization part happens in the, those four five steps Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I have one question, Umesh. Yeah. Um, you, know, you mentioned about exporting the private keys. Yeah. Right. Uh, is there any specific thing where uh, a person XYZ, although it's not it's not necessary, uh, but still, just asking it, uh, like uh, like if example, person is exporting the private key. and if if some how do other reasons uh, a person gets to know about the password as well so is there any specific thing uh, where a person uh, cannot log in from any other ip or any other systems how is it yeah uh, if that's what uh, i said ki uh, using the platform provides me flexibility of those things as well putting the restriction so so if my token can be purchased from my uh, my platform only or can be transferred to the person who is in platform only means if kyc and ml is done for that purpose first of all that person is not totally anonymous if you want that kind of restriction i am talking about 
so first of all that person is not totally anonymous and uh, like uh, and we we achieve lot of security in this way but still if you don't want to put those restriction so uh, we have flexibility to export your private key and using that private key you can uh, you can see your uh, balance in any any wallet so uh, i'm not sure whether basically i asked the concept of uh, basically the concept of exporting private key is that you should be able to use your account from any other application apart from dlt lab if this is hosted on a public network Yeah, is that correct, Omesh? Like, yeah, yeah, it's correct. I just now said. Yeah, it's it's correct. So, even though, for example, even though you have some account in uh, some exchanges, maybe Polynix, so from there also you can uh, withdraw your ether. So basically, we are providing like inter-exchange interoperability. Like, if you are trading something here, same, you can go and trade somewhere else. You just so, need to have your private key. But if you just want to keep trading on this particular platform, you want to buy it on this platform, you can use only the encrypted key which has been provided. So if you want, like, uh, obviously, uh, you are exporting private key. That is like uh, security risk because now, now onwards, you are the responsible who has to save, uh, who has to secure this private key. So even though if you try to export private key in uh, MetaMask, that also gives some warning that you have to make it uh, very secure because if somebody is having access for that private key, they can access your account. So it, until unless you are not and exporting private key, you for accessing your account, you need two things. Uh, one is like encrypted key, authorization key and password. So even though you have noted it down or you saved in some drive that encrypted key and that got hacked, but that that cannot be used until unless you tell the password also. Is that answer your question? Yeah, that answers. Okay. Do you mean to so, say import or do you mean to say export? Just want to type it. I mean to say export. So exporting means taking uh, account from here and uh, using it somewhere else in some other wallet. Okay, okay, got it. You are not using the DLT Labs platform basically. You are going into any different exchange since it is ERC20 token, it, it is tradable anywhere in the world. Whoever uses ERC20. Right, right, right. It will be exporting the case. I, I was just not following right. the entire thing, so sorry about that. Okay, okay, okay. So we are now short of the time. Actually, we have all, already shooted it by 27 minutes. So, guys, do ping me your email addresses if you want to get added in the Slack group, and just get involved in the discussion and let's get like let's enrich our knowledge on the Slack. In any case, whatever question you have and let's collaborate there.